everyone, welcome to the new webinar organized by Valcampus. I'm Virginia, one of Valcampus organizers. Today, talk about the COVID impact on business performance, industrial choice, and energy transition. The last minute of presentation will be the question and answer part. Please write your question in the chat box. It's now my pleasure to present Matteo Cerri, partner of EY. Thank you so much and have a good webinar. Matteo? Good afternoon and welcome to this webinar. My name is Matteo Cerri. I'm a transaction partner of EY based in Milan, Italy, and uh, coordinating the oil and gas transaction activities for the Mediterranean region. Uh, the purpose of today's call is to spend almost one hour together discussing and brainstorming about how the oil and gas sector is performing during the COVID pandemic period, as well as to understand how the energy services companies are reacting in this particular moment. Uh, we remember just a few months ago that the WTI price became negative for the first time ever. And we remember also the announcements of the CAPEX cut in the upstream sector. We remember 2020 versus 2019, a big cut, you know, of a value of roughly $80 billion, so quite a huge amount. But at the same time, we have seen more recently that, you know, the BEM price is, you know, constantly exceeding $60 per barrel. And we are starting seeing that, you know, some projections are saying that the Brent price might be exceed even the $80 per barrel. So we see also some good signs on, on you know, especially in the more recent period. Uh, by the way, this creates a bit of uncertainty, and I, we believe that it is important that companies operating in this segment uh, understand more how the market is moving and basically challenge their strategy in order to basically survive and sustain the business in this difficult moment, but also try to win in the mid and long term period, especially alongside the energy transition process that is clearly ongoing. So together with me today, I'm really pleased to have a few of my colleagues. First of all, Celine de la Croix, she's our global energy service uh, leader for EY, and she will bring us the perspective uh, from a global uh, view and see what are the key market trends and what are the activities that the key players in the market are doing in order to face the same difficulties that all the players are suffering from the current situation. Then after Celine, we'll have Nicolò Cerutizzaconi. He is the senior manager of the transaction team here in Italy, and they will make a big, you know, deep dive into the Italian valve manufacturer segment, and we'll see what has been the performance over the historical period. And finally, we will have Matteo Savoldelli, a senior manager of our EY partner strategy team, and she will present us the result of the survey that we did among some of the players in the sector discussing about how the business is performing during the COVID pandemic and what will be the performance after it, hopefully. And then, you know, finally, we will have, as Virginia said at the beginning of the webinar, a Q&A session when we will answer the questions that you might have. And, you know, please ask your questions during the webinar through the Q&A button that you see on the screen. And we'll be glad to take these at the end of the segment and discuss it again together. So let's start from the global perspective and Celine, happy to hand over to you. Thank you, Matteo, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. Very happy to be here and I really wish I could uh, see you all uh, face to face. I hope you're well. So in the next uh, 10 minutes or so, I'm going to uh, go through the uh, global oil field services market and especially focusing on where we are today and why we find ourselves here and some of the themes uh, which are important that I believe will redefine the future of energy services. So last year, uh, our sector was hit three times by COVID-19, by CAPEX cut and by climate change. Each are in interrelated. So, as you know, you know, COVID-19 has led to a non-precedented drop in global energy demand. This has resulted in oil prices falling as low as $23 per barrel in April last year. 
As a result of this, global exploration and production spend fell by a quarter last year. If you consider the capex cuts of the previous year, that has put capex spending for upstream at half the level of 2014, which was the peak of the market. On top of, on top of this, the pandemic has led us to confront the threat of climate change that is accelerating the reallocation of capital towards sustainable companies and dramatically shifting investors' behavior. So the good news is, as the vaccination rolls out uh, in Europe and uh, in the UK where I sit in, uh, in particular, we are seeing growth in global all demand and prices. The sector outlook therefore is more promising already now for 2021 and beyond. But I would like to say that you know, we are still not out of the woods and the industry is still very much in crisis. And I see three main reasons for this. One is that there are still too many companies and assets competing in a shrinking market, too much debt on many balance sheets and too few interested capital providers. So these, of course, have nothing to do with the pandemic, but the pandemic has accelerated the crisis our sector finds itself in. I, I, I compare actually the, the fall in the sector to an alarm clock. You know, one we've been snoozing for a while. You know, so when the pandemic hit, we were no longer able to silence it. But it is fair to say it has been a long wake up call for our industry. So now the world reemerges from hibernation. We are getting some relief in terms of higher oil prices. But I do think that to recover from the crisis, oil field services must change. I think we have reached a tipping point and doing the same thing over and over and expecting different results is not going to work. So it is time to take clear actions. So what different actions can we take, you will ask me. So I'd like to offer three pivotal themes, which in my view will redefine the future of uh, oil field services. The first one relates to energy transition. Next slide, uh, Nicola, please. The, the world is moving to a lower uh, carbon economy and all field services companies can fight it and get left behind or adapt. And all field services companies have adapted many times. You know, we've secured energy from a lot of uh, different sources, so we can adapt. I also believe we have huge expertise, which is relevant to the energy transition. So we should and we must seize the opportunities which energy transition presents to us. And I think this will expand our addressable market. This will allow us to capture additional growth and this will help us redefine investors perception and attract new capital. You know, we're talking and uh, Matteo and the team will speak about this. We're talking a lot about hydrogen, carbon capture, utilization and storage, offshore wind. There are many opportunities which traditional oil field services companies can uh, target in the new energy transition. But I would also like to say that we must also get our existing house in order. And this means decarbonizing the oil and gas value chain and our own operations and addressing our environmental, social and governance responsibilities head on. And for this to happen, it means investing in and developing new technologies which gives me to my, which leads me to my second theme for redefining the future, which is digitalization. As we say, there is nothing like a crisis to accelerate change. 
and Nicolo, Nicolo as well, we can move to this slide. Thank you. There is nothing to uh, like a crisis to accelerate change. We've seen it in the way vaccines have been developed. And in our industry, I think what has been really amazing is how quickly and successfully we've been able to work remotely at such scale while keeping some of these offshore platforms in deep water areas producing uh, on schedule uh, without uh, any interruption and and uh, you know some of these large project developments uh, as well so it has been really incredible how the industry has embraced the challenges of uh, of uh, the pandemic and accelerated some uh, technologies such as uh, remote operations for instance but you know, what I would say speaking to a lot of clients is that digital transformation is not easy and far from it. Our recent survey of digital investments shows that 65% of executives do not yet have a digital strategy. So we are seeing a lot of companies using technologies to reduce their costs, you know, to increase efficiencies and very few probably the largest ones starting to use technologies and transform digitally to create new revenue streams and provide new value to clients. So, uh, you know, I'd like now to look at the past uh, to understand uh, what I think will happen in the future. And I'd like us to go back actually to the 80s to understand you know, how technology at the time have impacted our industry and how I see them impacting our industry in the future. So, so Nico, Nicolo, if you move to the next slide, you know, I've tracked um, the level of uh, upstream capex and opex spend, and I've also tracked Brent oil prices. Can we go to the next slide, please? I don't know if I've got a delay in my uh, in my screen. So so let's go back to the 80s. Nicolo, can you move the slide or is it uh, stuck on mine? Uh, I have pulled it, so I think it is stuck in your, sc in your screen. Okay. Sorry about this, Nicolo. Thank you. So so uh, if you look at the left sl slide and again the bar chart shows the uh, global upstream capex spend and you can obviously see the grid cyclicality uh, and the green uh, 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 line shows Brent oil prices so let's go back to the early 80s right we are in the time of high oil prices the time of significant new capacity you know being added to the market Actually, in the early 80s, you know, there were more than 6,000 rigs in operations globally. Last February, according to Baker Hughes, they were uh, around slightly less than 1,300, so almost five times less than in the 80s. So, high oil prices, a lot of new capacity being added to market. Uh, new regions being developed, like the Alaska, the North Sea started becoming a net oil explorer, for instance. And all this was happening at the expense of OPEC and Saudi Arabia in particular, which was losing market share. So Saudi Ara Arabia stopped acting as a, as a swing producer and started producing again, which led to a dramatic fall in oil prices. So by 1986, oil prices had fallen by 68% and capex spent by 56%. And what followed in the 90s and the years 2000 was a deep market restructure led by technologies. So there were a lot of consolidation, companies merging together, a lot of restructurings, and, and as I said, a lot of technologies, new platforms, new technologies being developed, which really led to this massive growth. And, and when you look at what is happening now since 2014, I see very strong parallels to the early 80s. And it is my strong belief that technology is going 
again to be the unlock to the sector's uh, renaissance. Before technologies were used, you know, to, to, to specific applications like deep water, ultra deep water, uh, HPHT environments, now technology, you know, alone are not going to be the solution. So what companies are then trying to develop is a mastery of technology which connects an organization from the boardroom to the drill floor, which optimizes the end-to-end -end value chain and really delivers solutions to customers' issues. So for this to be successful, my prediction is that we are going to see a lot more partner partnerships and alliances between energy services companies and technology companies and at the high end of the market between big tech companies like IBM and Microsoft and others. So this is uh, very important and this leads me to my final theme in the market, uh, which is purpose and long term value. You know, we say uh, often there is an elephant uh, in, uh, in the room and this is uh, our reputation. Our industry is suffering from a reputation crisis. You know, we've, we are in an environment and this is valid as well across various sectors. We are in an environment of decreasing trust, evolving employee expectations around the company's role and responsibilities and a strong focus on climate risk. So we need to address this because everybody knows that oil is and will continue to be one of the planet's most important energy sources, even following transition to a different energy mix. So we need to re-articulate our purpose. We have examples of ENP companies which have already started their journey. I'm thinking about BP in particular, you know, rebranding themselves as integrated energy companies. All field services companies are early on in this journey, but they have a lot to offer and they need as well to refocus on, uh, on this purpose because this will allow them to continue to deliver sustainable results, attract new capital and build a better world, you know, for the industry, but also for, uh, for our world uh, as a whole. So a lot of, uh, you know, I, I, I don't think things uh, are going to be easy. There are big themes, but in my view, very fundamental to reposition the, the energy services industry on an upward uh, slope. Happy to answer any questions now or, uh, or later as you uh, see appropriate. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Nicola Ceruti Zacconi, and I'm a senior manager, part of the strategy and transactional oil and gas team based in Milan. This afternoon, I will have the pleasure to guide you through our analysis of the valve industry, oil and gas valve industry. And but before going down to the analysis, I just would like to spend a few minutes to have a quick overview of the sector in Italy. So. The oil and gas industry in Italy, uh, in particular the valve oil and gas producer, are really what we can call uh, um, a, a, a sort of really um, hidden jewels. And um, it is a champion of our economy because we have uh, 3 billion of euro generated by our players uh, among more than 300 of entities and um, more than 10,000 of employees employed. Italy is uh, among the, uh, it is the main European manufacturer and uh, also has really a dominant position in ball and plug valves, uh, but also, all, uh, also in the other categories. And this is very interesting. Uh, another very interesting characteristic uh, of the sector is that uh, there is a very strong geographical concentration with approximately 9% of the industry focused in 100 kilometers area and in three regions. 
And then we have also a very, in terms of concentration, we have three or four large players, and then a lot of small, medium-sized companies that drive the market. Now let's move to, the, to our analysis. As I mentioned before, we have selected a sample of 48 players with 22 classified in a cluster that is considered small with a value of production lower than 20 million, 18 entities that have been classified in the cluster medium, so with a value of production between 20 and 75 million, and then eight entities that are considered large with a value of production higher than 75 million. Also, as you can see from the bottom chart, the geographical presence of this, uh, of this uh, sample reflect what I said before. So as you can see, most of the entities are concentrated in, uh, in uh, two or three regions, in particular Lombardy, Piedmont and Veneto. But now let's look at the insight of our analysis. So in this slide, you can see at the top of the screen, uh, the brand price evolution. Whilst at the bottom, we have represented the accumulated value of production, EBITDA and the EBITDA margin. Here, as uh, it is really clear, looking at the chart, uh, the recent period has been a challenging period for the oil and gas valve producers. Since uh, there has been, uh, starting from 2013 and 2014, uh, a, pri a price of the crude oil really decreasing with a shock between 2013 and 2014, and then a slight recovery in the following periods. But looking at the financial, what we can see clearly is that uh, we have noted a, a reduction of the value of production between 2014 and 2017 that basically mirror the reduction in the crude oil prices. And then starting from 2017, we see a recovery in the value of production. But the real negative impact of the crude oil prices in, uh, let's say, in this, uh, in the performance of the oil and gas manufacturer are even more clearer when the analysis shift from value of production to EBITDA margin. Historically, we have noted that there is a correlation between the EBITDA margin evolution and the crude oil price evolution. This is very clear if we look, for example, at the reduction of crude oil prices between 2013 and 2014, with a, a, a time lag of one year, we see also a reduction in the EBITDA margin from 20% to 60%. But what is also worth it to notice is that we see that this correlation is true until 2017. But then after 2017, we see a recovery in the, in the brand price, but we see that the EBITDA margin continues to decrease. In this slide, we have basically represented the same parameters shown in the previous one, but we have split the analysis showing what are the performances of the entities included in the large sample, in the medium, and in the small. Here, what is very interesting to notice is that the medium enterprises were the one that suffered most the crude oil price decrease. In particular, if we focus our analysis between 2014 and 2017, we can see clearly that the EBITDA margin of this company helped moving from 20% from 20% in fiscal year 14 down to 7%, sorry, 11% in 2017 and then 7% in 2018. The reduction is uh, higher compared to the one noted for the small entity that show a reduction only of two points between 2014 and 2017. And also the reduction is low is lower if we look at the large entities because we see a reduction basically from 21.6 point down to 15.2. Among the factors that can explain this situation, we believe that small enterprises on one end has really uh, a lower amount of fixed cost and a more flexible structure. So they've been able to align their cost structure 
to the new level of value of production and to the new level of marginality. On the other hand, the large entities that are facing the most significant amount of fixed cost uh, also can leveraging on uh, an extended service, uh, an extended product offering, as well as to an extended geographical footprint. So the media were the one that has been more impacted. And this is also very clear when it comes to, 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 to see the bid the margin in 2014, we see that basically the medium entities margin, a bit the margin were aligned or just a bit lower than the one showed for the large entities, 20% against 21.6. But if we look at the most recent per, certain performances, we can see that the EBITDA margin of the medium is now aligned to the one generated by the small one. Here in this positioning matrix, we have represented um, the performance over the 2016 and 2019 period of the sample analyzed. In the horizontal axis, we have shown the revenue SCAGR for the period, while in the vertical axis, we have represented the profitability in terms of EBITDA margin changes in the same period. Looking at this chart, we can see that uh, only 25% of the sample has been able to deliver performance positive in terms of revenues increase, as well as in terms of increasing marginality. Whilst almost 60% 60, 60 of the sample either show an increase in revenues and a decrease in marginality, or shown even worse, a decrease in both revenue evolution and margin evolution. Once again, among the factors that helps uh, the top performer, there are two main characteristics. The first one is that they invested in R&D activities and also has performed some operation from the M&A side in order to expand their portfolio offering. And also at the second point is that they have been able to refocus a bit the geographical footprint and move from the area that perform worse to the area that perform better. The last slide that I want to show in order to complete the picture on our analysis is this, this slide that represents the net financial evolution, positive amount represent net cash, whilst negative amount represent net debt and a bit the margin. As you can see clearly, in the period 2013 and 2016, despite the challenging period and the reduction in the bit of margin, the accumulated net, net financial position of our sample improved. We see that in 2016, we reach uh, more than 400 million euro. But starting from 2016, and mainly as a consequence of the further reduction in the bit margin, we see that the entities start to burn out cash. And at December 19, net financial position, accumulated level, moved from positive to negative for the first time in the analyzed period. So to conclude, in the, in the current period, the sector in the recent years really experienced some challenging situation. And uh, the outlook of the market shows three main things. First, uh, there is a, a continuous action of the Chinese player that are the leader in the market and continuous increase their market share thanks to a price, thanks to the, uh, uh, let's say a strategy focused on price. Oil, crude oil price fluctuation that are every times more heavy. And then in 2020, we have seen also the COVID-19 outbreak that impact the performance. In this very challenging situation, I believe that one of the key questions is how to react. And so what could be the strategy in the short term in the medium long term and what are the options available. In order to talk about this, uh, I will hand over to Matteo that will present the COVID-19 impacts and then the strategic options. Thank you. And, uh, about what I'm gonna talk about in the next uh, few minutes. Uh, with the help of uh, the Valve Campus Associations, we launched a survey um, among the members of the association 
uh, survey that had uh, two main objectives essentially. First, uh, we wanted to uh, understand what has been the COVID-19 impact on the performance of uh, the players during last year. Uh, obviously an impact that we couldn't analyze from financials of the companies like Nicola just showed us uh, for the years before 2020. Uh, so we wanted to get a feeling from the operators themselves. The second key objective was then to also understand uh, what are the key strategic priori priorities, especially for a, a short term reaction to the COVID-19 crisis. Um, so I'll start by showing you, I would say, very basic three confirmations that we got from the survey. Um, Nick, if you can move to the next one. So first of all, I would say nothing surprising. If we look at the chart on the left. Uh, about two thirds of the respondent uh, told us that their business suffered a significant drop in 2020, um, about only 9-10% of, of the respondents uh, told us that they were able to uh, somehow stay afloat, while interestingly, almost a third of the respondents actually had a very good performance last year, where when we talk about high growth, they declared a 20% boost in the top line compared to 2019. Um, the second simple fact that the, uh, that the survey highlighted is that even though two thirds of the respondent had a quite a bad year, um, most of the players, most of the respondents felt that their reaction, their solidity uh, in the COVID-19 crisis was quite aligned to the reaction of uh, and the performance of their peers. So even though performance were bad, I would say the, the common understanding is that uh, the, the overall sector and the overall industry perform pretty poorly. Um, the, and what helped the companies stay afloat? What helped uh, somehow limiting the negative effects of uh, COVID-19 uh, was uh, especially having strong client relationships that uh, drove uh, resiliency last year. Now, the last fact that, as I said, is, is more of a confirmation of, uh, of our initial assumption and our understanding from, I would say, the, even the international view that Celine gave us at the beginning, is that clearly COVID-19 had an impact on energy transition. Uh, clearly, uh, there are about 70% of uh, the players that believe that energy transition is going to accelerate after COVID-19. And um, we're not showing a percentage here, but about eight uh, respondents out of 10 within the energy transition uh, landscape indicated clearly hydrogen as a new energy vector as uh, the number one theme that is going to impact the industry over the next few years. Now, I would say the next level of analysis that we were able to, to run uh, with the results of the survey was to try and understand uh, the uh, trend uh, in terms of performance of the sector that the players are expecting. Um, so if we move to the next page, what we've done here, we zoomed on the two thirds of the players um, that uh, recognized, uh, that recorded significantly low performance uh, in 2020. Um, what is interesting to note here is that, well, pretty obviously, uh, no, none of those players is expecting a return to 2019 performance uh, within this year. I think we have a lag because I, I still see the previous page, but I hope you are you're able to follow me. Um, so I was saying no one is really expecting performance to go back to 2019 levels this year, uh, which is I would say pretty pretty obvious given the fact that uh, we are 
just starting rolling out rolling out vaccines in in Italy, in Europe, and and globally. Uh, but the good the good news I would say is that uh, about 60% of the respondents are expecting a, a new normal uh, industry uh, situation to um, materialize by 2022. Um, and they are expecting by that year to go back to at least uh, the 2019 level of performance. Now, there are also players and respondents that are more negative. Uh, more or less a third of the respondents is expecting the new normal to materialize only in 2023, um, while uh, I would say a, a limited number of players is uh, looking at the market uh, in, a, in a different way. Uh, they are not estimating a return to a new normal, where a new normal means 2019 performance, uh, but they are expecting the market to just uh, set at a lower level of performance, and hence they are expecting a hockey stick market recovery, which is not really hitting back the 2019 levels uh, in the in the foreseeable future. Nicolo, I think we we, st we have issues with uh, because I'm still on the on the previous page. Is it fine now? Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Perfect. So if you can just go back to the to the previous one, just a second. I I finished talking about it, but I wanted to show it even graphically because it's uh, uh, it's quite interesting to know how, as I was saying, the the expected hockey stick has uh, different uh, is following different trends. In the, in the perspective of the of the various players in the industry. Now, going to the next one, what we try to understand then is uh, um, what are the key strategic short-term options um, that the market players are, are looking at? Uh, well, even in this case, it was mostly a confirmation of what we see happening on the in the global market. Uh, which means that number one prior priority is uh, survival, essentially. Uh, if you look at this, uh, you have as uh, higher priorities reducing capex and investments, improving capital allocation, increasing operating efficiency. So uh, pretty, pretty obvious that for someone who's uh, uh, lost 20% of its top line last year, the number one priority has to be securing the business and making sure that uh, uh, the, the cash is uh, is available to continue operations. What is pretty interesting to note is that, let's say, outside of the pure financial priorities, uh, uh, most of the respondents see reorganizing the supply chain as one of the key priorities, which would have a significant impact on the long tail of uh, suppliers and, uh, and business partners for the sector. Um, as I was saying, this is obviously confirmed uh, at, a, at a global level as, uh, as number one priority. If you go to the next page, uh, I don't really want to, to spend too much time on this, but uh, I would say there are a couple of messages that we should share. Uh, first of all, again, what Italian players are feeling in terms of uh, this is what I need to do now, is what most of international players, of international peers are also considering. So improving profit and, and securing stable cash flows, uh, which is at the same time also something that uh, should not worry the industry too much, uh, because it's an industry that historically has been putting a lot of emphasis on investments, putting a lot of emphasis on, uh, uh, let's say, improving technology portfolio. So seeing uh, something like I'm focusing on cutting my investments, cutting on R&D may, may look a bit worrying for the long term or the medium term evolution of the industry, but it's pretty comforting to see that even at the global level, I would say, as I said, business uh, business survival is the number one priority, and there is not too much uh, of a risk of being left behind. Now, 
going outside of uh, the scope of the survey, um, the obvious question uh, which we are showing on the next page is uh, basically what, what is next? Um, so in, uh, in the analysis that EY is, uh, is running at a global level, I think we have a nice framework that split the strategic response to, to COVID-19 in, in now, next and beyond. We're not showing you the framework here, but it's just to, uh, to explain that there's clearly something that you need to do now. And uh, as we just saw from the previous pages, is something that is pretty clear in the mind of, of every entrepreneur and, and top manager of, uh, of the sector. But there are clearly questions uh, related to what comes next and what should be coming beyond as a, as a long term vision. So focusing on uh, on what comes next. Uh, again, there are three three basic uh, themes uh, that we see in the market, um, and uh, let's say three three basic uh, strategic response that the that the players should uh, should consider. The three basic themes or basic assumptions are that market balancing will take time, so we don't expect clearly COVID-19 and, and the related crisis to disappear at the end of this year. Uh, so there will be a long, long-term, let's say medium-term effect uh, that is asking the players to properly plan and support them, as we are calling it here, an operational reboot. But at the same time, it's also, um, it's also pretty clear that the addressable market is going through a structural reduction, a structural shrinking. Um, again, like as we said, COVID-19 will not disappear in a year and, and everyone is pretty, is pretty certain that oil cannot, uh, let's say, disappear from our global economy in, in one year. So it's, it's more of a long term game, but it's pretty clear that in the traditional business, the, the, mark, the addressable market is, uh, is shrinking and companies need to understand how to adapt their business model with digital, with uh, revising the, the value chain, the supply chain and strengthening the, the core, strengthening what they, what they know they can do uh, in a in a in a successful way, and the third theme, which is more of a bridge between the next uh, and beyond, so the the strategic uh, team, the strategic actions, and and the long term vision is what uh, Celine was anticipating in in the initial part of of this webinar, which is understanding that the industry is clearly reshaping. Uh, it's going to be a gradual process. It's going to take time. Um, but it's important to understand that uh, the energy transition is going to impact the entire, the whole industry and players need to at least start thinking and uh, let's say planting the seeds for a long term strategic choice. So just to spend uh, maybe another minute on, on the last page, uh, which is probably something that can can even um, invite more questions. Uh, I think there are two very critical dilemmas that are in front of uh, each of the players in the industry. Uh, the first one is more of an old time dilemma. Uh, you would say nothing new, uh, while the second one is becoming uh, hotter and hotter as, as a topic uh, due to energy transition. So the old time dilemma is to choose whether we want to go through a let's say expansion route, which means improving scale, diversifying the technology portfolio, the customer portfolio, uh, which would clearly improve the top line, but in most cases sacrificing margin, um, compared to the option of uh, choosing to, to be smaller, essentially. Choosing to be smaller because you have a strong differentiating factor, because you have a technology driven business and you can say be a champion in your niche and be profitable even if uh, you you are small from a top line perspective while the the second dilemma is, is something that we have now mentioned a few times but it's all related about the energy transition so do you want to 
remain focused on your traditional business? Do you want to bet on the fact that energy transition is anyway going to take time? And there is, uh, I would say, there are benefits about keeping limited investments, keeping on doing what you know you are, you are good at doing. And as we are saying here, maximizing the harvest before uh, the, the, oil, uh, the oil market is disrupted. Or the alternative option is clearly to take a look at your capabilities, take a look at your technology, take a look at your customer portfolio and understand how and where to invest effort and capital to gear up your business for, for, G, for the energy transition. Clearly not easy questions, clearly a situation where it's easy to say there's, there's no right or wrong, but at least we see players in the nation in the end and we're sure even Italian players are in front of these dilemmas and need to start thinking about the, the route that they want to take. Now I'm giving the mic back to, to Matteo if we have uh, questions that we want to answer. Thanks a lot, Matteo. <clears throat> thanks, Celine. Thanks, Nicolò, for bringing us through this kind of important matters. And thanks also to the participants that raised a, a good number of questions that we'll try to answer in this last part of the webinar. Uh, maybe combining a couple of these, and maybe the first question is for Celine. So we understood that it is important to invest in new technology, in digitalizing the business in order, you know, to project the business in the you know next uh, you know years, but at the same time you know we have seen also from the slides that Nicolò has shown to us that uh, these kind of uh, times are really tough. Also in terms of liquidity, you know the cash you know has been basically burned a bit in order you know to manage the business in this kind of uncertainty. So the question is. Uh, based on your, you know, privileged perspective, you know, uh, for especially for small and medium sized businesses, what is the best way to approach the balancing between investing for, you know, the long term and, you know, keeping the cash for surviving in the short term? Yeah, and that's a very difficult question to answer in a short time, Matteo. <laughs> Uh, I, I do think uh, continuing to focus on uh, profitability, cost optimization, you know, building uh, uh, profitable businesses uh, is uh, is extremely important. So, uh, um, I, I personally, I would make it a priority. I know uh, as well there is still a lot of debt in uh, in this uh, specific sector. So. Uh, trying to improve uh, the, the financial position is critical, but then I would say maybe as well start bits by bits. You know, we speak about technologies and digital, which is a big word. Uh, and and uh, as I said, a lot of focus, especially among the smaller players, is on specific technologies, uh, you know, bit by bit, making changes within companies to reduce costs to operate more efficiently, uh, as well uh, provide um, uh, cheaper uh, services or products to clients to be more competitive. Um, and, and maybe this is the first step, do, do this, build your digital, do your digital transformation in, uh, in steps, start uh, by small steps, but do not forget it because, you know, other competitors, probably larger uh, ones, are going to quickly uh, get a, a step uh, advantage compared to, uh, compared to, uh, to the rest of, uh, of the market. Thank you, Celine. And uh, it seems that one of the uh, cheap uh, suggestion is coming from one of the participants that he says that uh, actually uh, what we have seen in the market is that some of the companies, they started simply changing the name and the brand, maybe including, you know, the term like energy or, you know, changing oh. the colors into green, doing this kind of stuff. Do you see this like a positive, you know, sign uh, or actually you might see this some risk that, uh, you know, the perception from the market is that uh, you are just, you know, walking around, but you're not really changing your business across the energy transition pattern? Yeah, there, there is a lot of PR and uh, indeed a lot of rebranding. 
uh, and as well, big announcements around the carbon emission by 2030 or beyond. But I, I would say it is important. Communication is important, showing that you are uh, aware of uh, your uh, uh, carbon impact and uh, energy transition and you yourself, you are transitioning is important. So we are not going to uh, be, I, I do think it's a beginning into all this uh, rebranding, uh, both with uh, energy companies and as well oil services companies. And, and yeah. it's, good, it's good for investors, it's good for lenders, uh, you know, whether it's real or not, of, of course it has to be more real than not, but it has a very positive impact uh, on, uh, on the market. Absolutely. Thanks a lot, Celine. And in the meantime, you know, uh, for the participants, feel free to raise other questions. We'll try to manage this as much as we can during these uh, few minutes that are remaining for the webinar. And maybe now we can ask to Nicolò. Uh, we have seen, based on the analysis that you has performed, that uh, you know the, the performance of the Vars manufacturer has deteriorated over the last uh, few years. But at the end of the game, we're still talking about 10% uh, EBITDA margin and considering all the issues that happen in the sector that Celine just highlighted at the beginning of the webinar might be considered a good result. So could you please provide us a bit more color about the performance of the segment of the valve manufacturers here in Italy and uh, also comparing with some other sectors? So this kind of 10% EBITDA margin is something you know to be seen as a good sign or something that uh, might trigger additional questions yeah yeah sure this is a good point so first of all we we as we mentioned before we are talking about the jewel of our economy and we are talking about hidden champions so we are talking really to a strong segment of our economy the quality and the liability of our player is very well recognized and uh, well known uh, all around the world. So this is the main reason because we the sector has been able to keep a good marginality. But uh, the point I believe it is more on how the market is moving because the market is changing and the market will change again in the future probably. So now I believe in, in this context where we see some difficulties but the situation is still good because margin are still good is really the right moment to stop one moment and rethink the strategy in, let's say, for the short term and also for the middle and long term. Because, you know, doing this now when the, when the situation is still good provides more strategic options and opportunities. And whilst if nothing will be decided now and we continue on this decreasing path, the risk is then that some decision will be needed to be taken when the situation will be more, let's say, in an emergency mode. And so the option will be less. Thanks a lot, Nicolò. Thanks you know, for, for your answer. And again, going through the list of uh, questions that are coming, maybe this one for uh, Matteo Savoldelli. So we have seen that uh, among the, the various options, uh, uh, the companies can consider to invest, uh, for example, in new technologies or in new vectors. As you said, hydrogen may be the most uh, relevant one in the upcoming years. And every time we speak about investments, uh, you know, spending more money, uh, we might think about uh, the potential support that uh, might come from the private equity sector. So can you tell us a bit more uh, on how do you see the private equity role in this specific segment, uh, uh, especially in light of the future energy transition. Yeah, yeah, sure. Well, I would say the the two topics go go pretty well hand in hand. Um, clearly, if we if we think about the traditional oil and gas business, it's it's far to be far from being one of the first option for for investments uh, for obvious reasons. Um, both in terms of, of performance, recent performance of the sector, and in terms of uh, future outlook of the sector. Uh, not forgetting that quite a few of the of the big uh, PE investors are now 
looking at even softer uh, aspects of their investment, which is, I, am I investing, investing in something which is good for the environment, good for the future of, of our children and all that. Uh, but if you, if you now take a look at what the oil and gas companies can do in the, uh, in the upcoming uh, market transition, then suddenly we believe that uh, the sector can be attractive for P investments. Um, if you're able to, to find a player which is, let's say, well equipped to ride the, the energy transition because the player has an interesting technology portfolio, has the ability of uh, address uh, a specific need that the energy transition is uh, is gonna uh, is gonna put on the on the table and uh, i would say obviously in a in a market situation like like the present one the one of the basic themes is also consolidation so if uh, if uh, if a player is able to position as a, a potential platform to a create a, a, a technology champion that can support energy transition and be uh, a player that is able to consolidate, uh, I would say, few few players to, to create maybe a, a national champion that, that's going to be pretty, pretty interesting for, for a P investor looking at uh, such, a, such a proposition. Great. Thanks a lot, uh, Matteo. Thanks for your answer. Maybe we have the time for the, the last question and try you know, to bring in together all the remaining ones. Maybe uh, for Celine, you know, the last one. Uh, we understood that forgetting for a moment the short term and the difficulties also generated by the COVID pandemic as well as by the, uh, the oil price drop, but looking at, you know, the mid term and the long term, Clearly, uh, companies have to do something different compared to the past, and maybe uh, some of the resources should come from other partners or other investors. So we discussed a bit about the private equity, but we know that uh, an alternative might be m &A, alliances that you mentioned at the beginning of the call. So what is the key trends that you are seeing or you might you know, foresee for the market uh, based on, you know, the privileged position that you have looking at all the key players uh, around the globe. Yeah, and uh, as you said, Matteo, I think one of the trends uh, I am seeing, uh, especially when it comes to developing uh, more technology uh, differentiated offering, is these alliances and partnerships between different uh, companies. Uh, you know, we've done uh, an analysis actually over time of these partnerships both between uh, upstream companies and um, uh, all energy services companies, but also between energy services companies and technology companies, small and large. You know, I mentioned IBM and Microsoft, but also some startup uh, or uh, smaller players uh, in, uh, you know, who, who can bring different uh, skills. Uh, um, so this is one point, uh, I think, uh, more alliances and partnerships with technology companies. In your area, I also think uh, maybe around the industrial sector, we see a blurriness of, uh, of various sectors and, uh, you know, growing these um, alliances or uh, consolidation, pure co consolidations with different types of uh, companies similar to you, but focusing on other sectors, the industrial market and other uh, is particularly interesting in, uh, in my view. Um, you mentioned private equity. It's quite interesting. Some companies have been sitting on uh, portfolio companies for a while, you know, not able to divest them because the market has been quite tough. Uh, so, so I do see uh, opportunities for private equity companies to buy new assets, uh, you know, some um, with uh, some work to do, maybe uh, some uh, operational restructuring to uh, to take on. Uh, 
Uh, but in general, uh, I, I do think uh, we are going to see in the short term more uh, corporate trade transactions with uh, uh, companies uh, in the sector or in adjacent sector merging rather than uh, private equity really investing, especially if there are issues around energy transition. Uh, you know, these uh, private equity firms have constraints uh, from their uh, uh, own investors to invest in clean or cleaner companies. Uh, and, and that's another point uh, to, uh, to emphasize the need towards diversifying uh, beyond oil and gas and uh, into new energy to attract capital. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot, Celine. Absolutely true. And uh, I believe that uh, what is coming clearly from what we said in the last hour is that uh, there are so many things happening on the market, so many challenges, so many changes. And as usual, this creates some issues on one side, but at the same time, this is creating a lot of opportunities. So it's important that uh, you know a player of this market uh, can understand you know how it is structured and try to get the best answer to the questions that uh, we just touched you know during the webinar today and see what could be the best option for remaining competitive and becoming more and more relevant in the future considering these challenging times. So of course you know the team not only myself but the entire team are more than happy to bring forward this kind of topics if you want. We left the contacts into the deck that will be made available and uh, thanking again all of you for participating to the webinar. I'll hand over to Virginia for closing it. Thank you, Matteo. Uh, thank you, the speaker of today for their good presentation. The webinar is uh, recorded and will be published on Val Campus YouTube channel. Please uh, subscribe on it. Then follow Van Campus on official LinkedIn page for every news for the next webinar. I wish you all a very nice day. Thank you, Matteo, and thank you all participants. Bye.